And then there was also a strong um, accent put on the sound procedure, the legality, um, the accountability of the action of contracting parties. Um, then a general uh, title on governance and uh, professionalization. All these objectives and trade-offs are, of course, in tension between them, especially between simplification and strategic procurement. There is a big uh, tension. And the solution that was um, chosen by the legislation was the so-called toolbox approach, meaning that uh, the tools are there. It's an enabling approach. There are the possibilities in the legislation, and then it's up to the contracting authority to choose between a simple procedure or a more sophisticated one based on also on its own capacities. Indeed, these new directives are very demanding <coughs> in terms of capacity of contracting authorities. But also, this, I will come back at the end. I will uh, try to quickly drive you to the, to the main features. First of all, Simplification. Um, the first aspect of simplification is the additional flexibility given to contracting authorities. I will not spend a lot of time there because uh, my colleague will, will talk about procedures uh, in his presentation. I will simply say that there is a, a more there are increased possibility for negotiations in the procedures. There has been a general overhaul of the procedure. Uh, that have been simplified whenever possible, and that uh, there are simplified rules for uh, smaller authorities. Um, meaning that this, I will tell you two words, local substantial authorities, so um, local authorities, we have the possibilities to use uh, prior information notices instead of contract notices, so a lighter uh, and quicker way to, to publish notices and we'll have the possibility to uh, fix time limits in agreement with, with, um, with tenders. Uh, this, of course, is subject also to agreement of the member states. We'll have to choose if implementing or not this, this feature for sub-central authorities in the transposition. Another aspect of simplification is the reduction of administrative burden. Um, here we have a substantial uh, change. First of all, the principle is now that the contracting authority in the first phases of the procurement procedure has to rely only on set declarations. The documentary evidence, the papers, the certificates will have to be submitted only uh, by the winning bidder. Um, in order to simplify and streamline and render more transparent this use of self certifications, we are preparing uh, the European Single Procurement Document. <coughs> this will be an electronic um, form that will be translating identical in all languages um, that will have to be filled in both by contracting authority and by the bidders with uh, the elements that are necessary to qualify the bidder, the exclusion criteria, selection criteria, um, and all the initial set declarations. This will be signed and handed uh, to be electronic and will allow for the qualitative selections and the evaluation of tenders. All the paper will be submitted later. There is also the possibility a look into the future uh, actually, if in some member states it's already present for some areas, the possibility also for contracting authority to go itself to check into national databases if the third certification is correct. That is why in the European Single Procurement Document we are preparing a, a part where it will be possible to include the, the email address, um, the link, uh, where the contracting authority can access the document directly, so there will not even be in the future exchange of, of paper documents. Another aspect of the simplification is the mandatory use of, of electronic tools for communication in public procurement. 
This has been strongly negotiated by member states that wanted to resist. I think Romania is quite advanced on this, <coughs> this aspect, but others are not. Um, it will be mandatory um, at the end of the transposition period, but member states will have the possibility to prolong um, paper uh, procedures until autumn 2018 immediately mandatory for central purchasing bodies. Oh. Uh, yes, this is the timeline for, um, for the communications. In uh, um, 2017, it will be mandatory for central purchasing body, and in October 2018, it will be mandatory for everybody. This is quite important, I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, reduction of, of uh, expenditure, it is a, a really a big, big impact. Another aspect of simplification has been uh, um, the, um, <coughs> um, provisions that have been introduced in order to clarify the scope, and I'm thinking of the public public uh, um, exemption from the directive. I will uh, give you the details if you if you want to. Uh, later, but there has been a codification of case law, and it has been defined. Uh, uh, it's an area where there is no actually no legislation. It's only the, the case law of the Court of Justice. So therefore, there is a lot of insecurity. Um, so it is now defined what is a vertical in-house corporation, and uh, <coughs> with, with uh, different features and also what is the so-called horizontal cooperation, all based on the codification of case law and of the further, um, further elements that have been negotiated uh, in the trials. And another very important element is the end of the distinction of the services between ACE and services A and B, priority and non-priority services. At the moment, there, are, there is this distinction in the directives meaning that the services that are listed in Annex 2A are um, subject to all the, the provisions of the directives, while the services listed in the 2B are called non-priority services, are subject only to a few um, <coughs> provisions. And there is also a category that is called other services. So all the uh, services that are not listed explicitly in Annex A are subject to only a few rules. Now the logic is completely reversed. This, the services are subject to the entire set of rules of the directives, <coughs> unless they are explicitly uh, listed in an annex, annex 12. Um, this annex and this category of services was initially reserved for social, uh, health, educational, and recreational services where the Commission thought it was uh, useful to have more flexibility and less procedural rules. But of course, during the negotiation, this category has uh, been uh, increased, so there are other services there, like hotels, restaurants, legal services. Um, but the important thing uh, is that a lot of um, uh, prior non-covered services are now covered by the entire scope of the directives. The second aspect, uh, as I told you, was the better access for SMEs. So there are provisions to facilitate small and medium enterprise, like the division into lots. It's not mandatory to divide into lots, but if the contracting authority does not do it, it has to explain why. So it's an encouragement, or at least a, yes, an encouragement to think whenever possible to divide into lots. There is a turnover cap. It is not possible to ask for financial requirements that uh, the turnover requirements that are the more than the double of the estimated price of the, of the contract. There is a possibility to uh, impose direct payments to subcontractors. Um, and the European single <coughs> document and this facilitation in the, the selection procedure is certainly most beneficial to small and medium enterprises. Then comes the strategic procurement, as I told you, social innovation and environmental considerations, how to include them in the procurement decisions. Um, the main principles. Uh, 
the freedom to, of choice of what to buy is maintained. So the, 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 this has been debated at the beginning. There are no rules on what to buy, so simply rules on how to buy. Um, what to buy can be possibly reserved to sectoral legislations, but not to general public procurement rules. The link to the subject matter, the fact that the criteria you take into account have to be linked with what you're going to buy, is maintained. This is the basic principle of public procurement in order to avoid discriminations. But there is a, an evolution of this concept because there is inclusion of the production process. Um, if before, uh, or now, still now, uh, the link with the subject matters means um, that you can ask for criteria that you can almost feel, see, and touch in the product you're going to buy. Now this is over. It is clarified that everything that goes into the production process from the beginning um, can be relevant into the uh, purchasing decisions. For instance, it is now clear that you can ask for a, a product to be produced in a less, uh, less damaging way for the environment, less production of CO2, for instance, in the production process. This is a relevant criteria and it can be used if, if somebody wants to. Also, social aspects can be used. You can um, ask that um, disadvantaged or vulnerable people are included in the, uh, in the production process or in the provision of the service. You can require now labels directly if the criteria that are uh, subjected to the label are linked with the, with the subject matters. You don't need to describe all the features of the labels. You can simply state this is the label and look for why, of course, accepting equivalent labels. There is an horizontal clause, the so-called social uh, clause, but it's also environmental. Um, the compliance with applic applicable obligations in the fields of environmental, social, and labor law established by union law, national law, collective agreements, or by international law, um, there are conventions that are listed, has to be complied with. Um, this compliance has to be ensured by member states. <coughs> this has important consequences in uh, several phases of the procurement. For instance, it will be mandatory to exclude uh, an offer for, for abnormally low grounds if the contracting authority finds out that the abnormal, uh, abnormally low uh, offer is abnormally low because there is no compliance with these obligations. There is a new exclusion grounds for non-compliance. It's, it's a non-mandatory one, but the member states can make it mandatory if it wants to. Um, these are all applications of this horizontal clause. Green procurement, where well, I told you already, labels, production process, and the life cycle costing. It is now possible to use life cycle costing in the costing in the award to the award criteria. There are two um, criteria that are only economic. One is the lowest price, and now there is also the lowest cost. Lowest cost meaning that you can, uh, apart from price, take into consideration also maintenance. Uh, uh, energy consumption, and if you want to the entire life costing, which means up to the end of life of the product or the service concern. And um, social procurement, I told you already, it's, it's, it is possible to ask for integration of disadvantaged persons. Um, it is possible to ask for fair trade products. This is the consequence of the judgment of the court during the negotiations. There is a more um, wider uh, scope for uh, reserving contracts. Um, now it is possible to reserve contract contracts to sheltered workshops um, only. 
and when these workshops uh, um, have more than 50 percent of of, uh, of uh, handicapped person in the in the workforce, now it is wider. It includes all sort of uh, enterprise that have as an objective the inclusion of these disadvantaged and vulnerable categories, not only handicapped mentally or physically, but also uh, marginalized people, and uh, and the proportion the percentage of the employed people uh, is um, lower than 30 percent. Um, there is a, a long article on subcontracting with a lot of options for, uh, for member states to, to transpose. As I told you, there is this uh, special categories of services, uh, um, social services plus others, where there is a light regime, we call, we call it light regime. It, there is a much higher threshold 750,000 euros, and uh, um, there is an, an obligation to publish a prior publication that was not existing before for the PPP services, plus uh, the obligations to the, the obligation to um, publish an award notice. But apart from that, in respect of the main principles of the treaty, it's only national rules that apply. This above the threshold. Uh, below the threshold, there is also a sort of presumption that uh, there is no cross-border interest. This means that you don't have to apply anything at European level. This is a, a, a presumption in the absence of contrary elements. One of these contrary elements is, of course, the presence of EU funding. So if you have EU funding, you cannot presume that there is no cross-border interest. But in the other cases, you can be quite safe saying that you don't need to publish it to your level. Finally, sound procurement. There is an increased transparency. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I have asked my presentation mainly on classical sector, but of course there is, there is a new directive of concessions. This is a major novelty. Um, which means that there is prior publications for concessions. As I told you, there is public, uh, prior publication for all types of services. E-procurement is also a, a, a plays an important role in, in increased transparency and, uh, and the standardized health declaration as well. During the procedures, there has been the reinforcement of exclusion grounds. There are now exclusion grounds aimed at excluding uh, genders who have concluded agreements, cartels between them, that have tried to influence the contracting authority, that try to breach confidentiality. There is, for the first time in the EU legislation, a definition of conflict of interest and the obligation for member states to take measures to prevent, identify and correct conflict of interest when they <coughs> Um, there is a, a discipline of, of prior involvement in market consultations and the possibility to exclude for prior involvement in case there are no other less intrusive means to, to solve the, the, the unbalanced situation. And uh, there is a new um, <coughs> discipline of abnormally low tenders. Main feature is that, that is now necessary, mandatory to ask for uh, reasons of um, uh, why a tender is so low. There is a, a, the initial proposal of the Commission, there was the identification of an abnormally low. There were um, figures and percentages that identify what is an abnormally low. Unfortunately, this has not been retained. Neither Parliament or Council wanted it, so it has been cancelled. Um, therefore, there is no definition of abnormally low, but in case of abnormally low, and there is the obligation to ask for explanation, even if you want to, uh, in any case, accept the abnormally low, you want to take the risk. In any case, you still have to ask for the, for the reasons. Uh, there is only one case where you cannot accept an abnormally low. It is, as I told you, when the reasons why it is so abnormally low are the non-compliance of social labor law and environmental obligation. And there is, um, for the after award phase, there are some novelties there. Um, new provisions on modification of contracts. This is also new in part. Uh, <coughs> certainly it is more, more systematic. 
and there is a codification of case law in this case as well. There are clear rules on when you, want to, when you can modify a contract without publishing a new call for tender, <coughs> trying to reduce the, the legal, legal insecurity on this matter. Um, termination of contracts, there are provisions that um, make it mandatory to allow for termination of contracts. And there are um, reporting obligations of member states on, on, this, uh, on this aspect. On the measures they take to prevent and detect fraud and corruption. Finally, <coughs> governance and professionalization of procurement. Um, the governance part of the directive has been very much um, reduced uh, from the initial commission proposal to the, the end result. Um, and this is certainly. Uh, a pity from the point of view of the Commission because, of course, we were uh, extremely aware of the fact that this, uh, uh, these new rules require a lot of, of uh, knowledge, know-how and professionalism by public, uh, public authorities and by contracting authorities. Um, so the idea was to also in, um, involve member states more in the government's of the entire system. As it has already been said this morning, uh, public procurement um, mistakes or irregularities are uh, the main cause for problems in the EU funds, for Romania certainly, but not only for Romania, in many, many other member states. And uh, the European Commission alone is not in a position to monitor public procurement in the member states. Uh, therefore, we wanted to share the burden and uh, make a little bit more uh, responsibility on the shoulders of member states. They did not want it, not surprisingly. <coughs> um, therefore, there are, uh, well, there, there are some survivors, some reporting obligations, <coughs> and uh, the, the obligations to provide training and assistance to contracting authority, even in not such a developed form as the Commission would have uh, liked to. In any case, um, what I want to tell you here is that um, this is certainly a legal framework, a new legal framework that is very uh, sophisticated in some aspects. Um, it can be uh, rendered simple, as I tell you, as I told you, there is this toolbox, toolbox approach. Um, so it can be made simple, if there is no need to apply environmental criteria if uh, uh, you don't want to, but still it requires a lot of uh, administrative capacity and this is lacking um, uh, in the EU, especially at sub-central level and smaller uh, contracting authority. Um, not everything in the directives is mandatory in any case, also for man member states to transpose. There are a lot of choices for member states to make during the transposition process. This has been strongly wanted by member states themselves. There has been a tension between Parliament and Council on this aspect. Member states wanted to have the possibility to modulate uh, these rules and to adapt them to the national reality. Um, this possibility is there. Therefore, transposition process is extremely, extremely uh, important. And um, the message I want to give here, because I've heard it already two times, that you want to go fast in transposing, but I'm not going to tell you that this is only the Romanian attitude, other member states have the same attitude. Um, we want to give the message that you have two years, take the two years time. Uh, take the time to properly assess the current situation. This, as it was mentioned in Romania, is being done through a stra national strategy. Yeah. And this is very, um, very useful and we think it's the right approach. And we propose this approach also to other member states. Um, try to identify what the weaknesses are of the current functioning and also before adopting new rules and new provisions, make an impact assessment of these rules. Take really the time 
to think of the entire architecture of the system, both from an institutional point of view and from the uh, on the ground of the provisions and legislation, what the impact can be, what can be done in order to improve coherence and uh, improve um, easiness and user friendliness application. Um, and also um, take the time to enhance the administrative capacity of the contracting authority. Only in this way it will be possible to deliver good results in terms of public spending. And um, only in this way uh, public procurement can deliver its objective of best value for money and growth. Otherwise it will be still an area of weakness of, of a non-competitive and non-transparent way of spending public money. This is all I wanted to say for the moment, but of course I'm available for all type of questions and later on for discussion in the round table.